Hello everybody and welcome to the Architects Bookshop Isolation Talk, it's number 25. I'm running, we're running a bit of behind time tonight, so apologies for that. Uh, we've had a few audio issues. Uh, so welcome, tonight we've got Branch Studio Architects here to talk to us. Um, uh, so let me just bring them on for five seconds so we can say hello. G'day guys, Brad and Nick, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Oh, good, your audio is working, yay, thumbs right. up. <laughs> We've just had about 15 minutes of panic trying to get their audio to work, so thanks. How's, how, are you, how are you going down there in Melbourne? Yeah, we're going okay. Um, we're out of lockdown, of kind of officially, I suppose, um, and uh, I'm COVID free. I, uh, I thought I had COVID yesterday and got my, actually while we were doing this, uh, this sound test this morning, I got the all clear, which is good, so happy days. Very happy day. Awesome. Have we been yeah. to a restaurant yet? Uh, no. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> not yet. No, no, not, not yet. yet. Thank God we've regionally, so we've been doing it for a little while, but um, yeah, not so much in the city yet. Oh, very good. Yeah, um, before, before we get into it, I just thought I'd say uh, we should acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land in which we're sitting. I'm on Gadigal land of the Aura Nation. Where are you guys? You were... Well, we, we're, we're in um, the... Uh, Melbourne City, yeah? Melbourne City, <laughs> so it's, it's painted on the front of our building. It's the Warren Digi. Yeah, very um, good. Very good. It's, um, sorry, I, I, I totally threw you in that then, didn't I? didn't even tell you I was going to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good I know the front of the building, so we should know it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good test. Uh, yes. Um, but also, I thought I'd mention this book. This came out, or I got this in the mail today for anyone interested in good Australian architecture written by excellent man Cameron Brune. Um, it's essentially two decades of architecture in Australia by Thames and Hudson. Uh, amazing book, amazing um, coverage of some really remarkable architecture that's been delivered in the country. Uh, some really great essays too, dare I say, by some of my favourite people, Helen Norrie, Laura Harding, David Newstein. So there's a bit of good reading in there. So for anyone who's looking for a new something to read out of Melbourne lockdown, you've got a bit more time on your hands, or you've got no more time on your hands now, Melbourne, but you know, may as well get into it. Why not? Came out just in time. Um, so guys, Branch Architecture, Branch Studio Architecture, you have a book, which we had a launch of in the bookshop when we were open. We do. Um, we yeah, we, we, yeah, we might talk, yeah, talk a little bit about it tonight. So Awesome, awesome, awesome. So look, before we, while we get started, you guys could share your slides. The, the reason I um, thought it would be good to ask these guys come on, when we were in the bookshop, when we were operating, uh, we had um, Nicholas and Brad come up to Sydney and launch the book in the Sydney office, do a bit of a talk. It was really great. It was really nice to see their process, um, the uh, quality of work that they were doing. So look, without further ado, over to you two. Okay, great. Well, hello, and um, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, and thanks to Adam for this ongoing series. Um, it's been a real pleasure tuning in to these talks over the last uh, few months, particularly during this time of lockdown. Um, so I wanted to start off uh, this talk by just really acknowledging our, our small but seriously capable team of staff who have been working away from home over the last six months and really doing an incredible job. Um, there's typically a maximum of six of us in the office. Um, we've always kept it this way. And I think it's one thing we're really proud of as, a, as an office, being a small team, but being able to take on larger projects and really maintaining a high level of rigour to the work. Um, I think one thing that's really important before we kind of start talking about the work um, is, is us seeing opportunity in even the smallest of projects. And um, it's something we've worked really hard on and, and really tried to main, maintain a conscious effort um, over the last eight years of practice. Um, so we start the project. So this was our very first project and our first office, which we grafted onto an existing sculpture studio. Um, it's located in an apple orchard about 25 kilometres southeast of Melbourne. Um, it was a really small space, about 25 square metres, which we built for ourselves. Sorry, we built by ourselves, I should say, uh, for about $30,000. And it had enough space for Nick and myself to work a small meeting area for our client meetings and one other desk for Nick's landscape architect brother who shared the space. We cladded it using old recycled corrugated iron lying around in nearby paddocks with reference to the found and reinterpreted works of Rosalie Gascoigne. And so basically from our earliest of projects, we really had a, a keen interest in art um, in the way to assist us um, in thinking about our architectural projects. 
We used leftover glazing from an old commercial job for the windows and the interior was completely clad in CD plywood. So the width of the form is about 2.4 metres wide, the same as a standard sheet of plywood to eliminate cuts and waste. And for us, this project was a really great introduction uh, to an understanding of creating with limited budgets for projects to come. Um, there's always been a really, uh, you know, we've both really had a keen interest um, in experimenting by making with our hands. And as this really good way of understanding how things go together, um, we found ourselves in situations where builders will say, you know, certain things can't be done. And then we'll go away and make it work through prototypes and just basically make it happen that way. So, and I guess also too, there's, there's always been this, obviously the fact that buildings take so much time to, to get built. So we see the furniture making process as this great way to see some of our ideas come to fruition more, more quickly. Yeah, so I guess we both have a shared interest in, um, in concrete and the capabilities of that material and understanding what, um, what you can and can't do with that. However, we've also experimented um, with making mostly through furniture and objects again across various materials, um, including things like this um, steel table, um, which was constructed from a single sheet of, um, of expanded mesh um, and cut and folded and then kind of crudely welded together. Um, timber, and, and we mentioned plywood earlier, but it was a pretty important material for us early on, um, especially due to its affordability and then appropriateness for a variety of uses. Uh, this is a plywood sofa built for a small apartment fit out. And, and concrete, we've, um, we've done the last um, experiment, experimented extensively with, with concrete. And this is one of, I guess, the more agricultural and unre unrefined pieces, um, very cosy looking concrete sun lounge. So I guess this diversity in the way of practicing has, has, has also read, really led to some great opportunities. Um, in 2017, we were invited to lecture at um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Ateliers in Western Arizona, which was amazing. Um, but we were both invited because we, we, you know, basically we had this background in both architecture and, and furniture, furniture design and making. So um, I think in a lot of ways, there's a strong commonality between um, our furniture projects and our buildings. And in that, often we're trying to make them do just more than one thing. Um, so there's this level of adaptability to them. Yeah, so kind of leading off on this idea of adaptability, one of our um, early residential projects um, started back in um, 2014 and completed a year or so later was um, this project called the Balnaring Retreat. Um, the site for the project was within a rural farmland property in Balnaring, which is down on the Mornington Peninsula here in Victoria. Um, and the client wanted a small but flexible studio space overlooking uh, an existing body of water to the north of their main dwelling. We chose to site the building with a northern orientation, looking over the water to a large established tree beyond. Um, and the retreat was one of a couple of projects that we completed on this site for these clients. Um, and we'll discuss another project shortly. The siting strategy for this building was uh, for it to sit heavy in the site at the rear and then extend itself over the water to the north, protruding out and hovering just above the surface. Step down in the slab against the northern glazing forms a sunken reading lounge that creates a one-to-one -one connection with the water and the immediate landscape beyond. And then here the uh, eastern elevation shows that notion of anchoring in uh, at the rear and then extending and protruding out over the water towards the north. This is a detailed shot of, um, of that exact construction and, and the, the concrete floor falling away from the, um, from the bottom of the building and closely following the contours of the, uh, of the banks of the dam. And then that same detail in construction. So the initial sketches show that uh, context is a key driver for the sighting and, and form. Um, this idea of heavy and, and light was, was there right, right from the start. Um, and also this orientation towards the, the view and, and the north. And again, um, the forming plan was created through a series of planes that overlap and stack up on each other to create uh, expansive and also more intimate discrete openings um, towards the landscape and the um, surrounding garden. And then an abstract of that plan idea in those shifting planes. Um, so it became apparent through the early discussions with the client, this building, needed to be um, pretty non-specific in its program, but also have the capability to be divided and formalized um, in various more conventional aspects um, you might find in a dwelling. So such as sleeping and sitting and eating and bathing spaces. Um, 
So the key driver for the plan became notions of uh, flexibility and adaptability, although at the heart of it all, it was still a building about retreat. So with this idea of retreat in mind, our approach was to look at how the internal space could be transformed in a low-fi, low-tech manner. Um, and we didn't want it all to be automated or controlled by a button. It was more about mindfully manipulating the space. And we referred to this concept as um, a slow building for slow living. And all of the um, external walls offer some type of adaptability of program. So the south wall um, houses the fold-away bed and a small desk, a series of storage, including an open bookshelf. Um, the wall lining of the east wall folds down to create a long table with shallow storage between the timber wall framing behind. Uh, the west wall is the kitchen alcove and a series of desk and storage spaces as well as the bathroom beyond. And then the northern end, as we've already discussed, uh, incorporates a sunken day bed and reading area. Um, and this sunken area can also be infilled with um, plywood boxes to increase the floor area if required. This is an internal view showing that outlook over the water to the trees beyond. And then a construction image of the same aspect showing the siting. We actually had to take some of the water out of the, um, out of the dam for construction access around that front edge. Um, and then this series of shots just to end on show the finished space um, in its variety of configurations. So here we have the space uh, all closed up. Um, and then we have um, the walls folding out to form the long table and then finally the sleeping nook and the, and the curtain. Which brings us to our next project, uh, the Pavilion Between Trees. It um, was the second project completed on this site uh, in Balnaring for these clients. The brief for this project was essentially for a new master suite consisting of bathing, dressing and, and sleeping areas. Um, and as the spaces unfold, our strategy was for the floor level to rise gradually by a series of platforms. Um, ascending and dividing the program across the length of the building. The gradual rise of this uh, floor plate delineates each of the programs internally, allowing the spaces to possess a different relationship to the garden context, but also the infiltration of natural light. And we saw this procession of sorts um, almost like a, speaking to the idea of ritual um, and purpose and light, and we, we saw these similarities with this notion um, and those of the ancient spaces of the suburb and Roman baths in Pompeii shifts in light and um, floor levels are kind of used to generate hierarchy of space. Um, the strategy for dealing with the existing building, this one was for the, um, for the additions to be semi-detached from the existing residence. So we want to create separation from the main house and give the pavilion its own identity amongst the landscape. And then starting as a simple rectangle, the plan then evolved through a series of Restrained but deliberate formal gestures, I guess, directly referencing the existing context. So there was small gouge made to create a courtyard space to house um, an existing silver birch tree to the south. Uh, while this angular slice to the end of the pavilion orientated the sleeping space towards a view corridor through existing vegetation and towards the setting sun. Uh, and then two extruded window boxes um, are pulled out beyond the floor plate like this to directly interact with the adjacent existing trees on the site. The external material, sorry Adam. Can I ask you a few questions as we go yeah. on? Yeah. yeah. It's, there's, um, there's because I, I can tell in some of the detailing, there's quite a lot of strong sense of Melbourne in your, in your detailing. Is that fair to say? Is it the, is it the black Adam? <laughs> 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 no, no, it's there's like there's some beautiful referential detailing, you know, like in, even in one of your early sketches, the one of your early drawings, the wraparound shelf system, and then this very beautiful protruding box, which I'm thinking, you know, is um, referencing some of Wardle's work. Is there a, you know, did, have you worked with Wardle, or is, was were you taking some reference from him, or what's the? Because it's beautiful, it's gorgeous work. I mean, some of the detailing you're getting now, I can't believe you can get that on a house. Yeah, I'll let Brad answer. Oh, look, yeah, question. look, I suppose, yeah, I look, I, we've, I, we've always respected John's work. Um, I don't, and it's actually, I don't think we even really kind of contemplated it during this project. Um, yeah, it was kind of, kind of removed from that, um, I guess that, that, that thinking, but, um, you know, obviously, um, yeah, we admire his work, but, um, yeah, I think there's a real warmth, um, that, uh, the, John Wardle, the residential projects have, um, and this kind of wrapping of joinery, and, and especially for, for projects, these smaller scale projects, they create quite 
quite a snug, warmth environment. So I think we've definitely kind of taken cues, whether consciously or yeah. subconsciously. Yeah, I, I think I think also like uh, this. I think this project really for us was like a real pivotal point in kind of thinking about materiality, thinking about light, and really uh, thinking about sectional space too. Uh, yeah, and maybe you know, like yeah, like Nick said, maybe kind of like you know, subconsciously it maybe have come, have come from some of that thinking, but really. Um, yeah, for us, this is really a, a kind of turning point, in, I guess, in the work when we started thinking about um, those elements. Um, and that kind of, you know, this, this, I guess that thinking leads on to some of the other work and some of the new work that we've been doing as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, to, I wasn't, wasn't meaning to interrupt. I was just captivated by that last view. It was amazing. It's gorgeous. You know, that's, that's fine. Um, it makes it a lot more relaxing to answer questions as we go. So, um, so the external material palette um, of these two buildings um, was they were developed together. Um, the charcoal rammed earth and oil timber is predominantly um, the response to the rural context, the farm context. Um, and it was really important to us that these buildings uh, continue to embed themselves into their surrounds over time. Um, and then the tones and textures specifically of the rammed earth uh, were tested and developed with the specifics of this site in mind. We originally didn't have rammed earth in mind for these projects. It was um, something that the client requested and um, we were happy to oblige. We, we love the material, but we, we wanted a specific kind of toning. Um, and here's some construction shots of the rammed earth kind of showing the, the wall stopping and starting around these existing trees, hence the project really in between trees. Um, I, sorry, I, I would, I would kind of think, I'm just, just thinking, you know, I, I guess these kind of window boxes and those sorts of elements, for, I don't know, for me, like they're more sort of references towards McGlash and Everest in, at Heidi or something like that, um, where you get that kind of beautiful spot where you kind of go out yeah. and reflect, um, you know, within that kind of tree canopy that's out there over the landscape. And they're very, I mean, there's there's lots of references. We can draw lots and lots of references, Utsun yeah. and Khan and you know, heaps yeah. of them. It's just, a, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, I guess these these two slides working together, if I go back, um, just that real kind of bringing in with a real restraint palette internally and framing those views to those significant aspects of the garden and then really bringing in the greens um, was, was pretty important in this project. Um, so a couple of the initial sketches, again, just really talking about the idea of siting this building amongst the garden and, and amongst the existing vegetation and how that, that might formally start to take shape. Uh, and then the final floor plan. So kind of as mentioned, the, the building is semi-detached from the main dwelling. So internally, this provides these more private spaces with a sense of calm away from the, the main house. Uh, entry to the pavilion is provided by the extension of an existing corridor in the main house. Um, and this we turn this into a central boardwalk that essentially splits the ensuite areas into two distinct spaces before peels away um, into separate paths around the central arrangement of joinery. So this divides and defines the robe areas. And then while the robes and the bathroom areas are split into separate portions, both for function and privacy, the bedroom is the area where the previously individual zones come together as one space, eleva elevated well above the ground by now, and then opening up expansively through that U corridor. Creating um, the right atmosphere internally was also crucial for this project. Um, given that these spaces are habited predominantly at the beginning and the end of each day, it was important for us to adequately capture the moods of these times within the space. So the pavilion restra restrains from um, excessive use of artificial light um, uh, in, in the aim to create a more natural atmosphere in which to begin and end each day. The discrete earthly approach to the lighting allows the tones and the textures of the individual materials then to reflect the current external climate at any given time. So we like the idea that a grey day outside will impart those connotations over the internal materiality. Uh, with the rammed earth walls feeling darker and heavier and the timber becoming more monochromatic and the stone bathroom areas even feeling more cave-like and then alternatively on a bright brighter sunny day you get dappled light from the tree canopies above and the warmer tones of the earth and the wood um, start to be uncovered and the, then the textures are really exposed by the vibrancy of the natural light um, and there's there's really no attempt um, to block out the external environment in any way in this building um, uh, and create a synthetic interior. Instead, 
this building really aims to preserve some of those sensory qualities that we may have enjoyed, I guess, in the days before kind of alarm clocks and things like that. We, wanted, we really wanted to um, highlight that idea of, of waking up with the sun and also kind of going, going down with the sun. Um, so, <clears throat> so this is the first uh, private house commission we received as a practice back in 2015, and we completed it late, late, late last year, actually. Um, it's located on Phillip Island in the east coast of Victoria. And this house is real, really a, a really an in investigation of a, of a spatial narrative, I suppose, that's deeply connected to its site and surrounds. So the client came to us with this idea for a courtyard house, um, which after reflection worked really well within the context of the site. But we wanted to elaborate on that and on this on this quite typically insular, quite urban model and redefine it as an open courtyard house, given the proximity to the coastline um, and dunes. So you can see here in the site section, given the nature of the site, there was no there was limited or no opportunity to, do, to directly capture views um, because really of the density of the coastal dunescape to the north. But we, we saw it as a great opportunity to create a continuity with the landscape, which we did through this central courtyard. So bringing the landscape right in um, amongst the courtyard and the house. Um, the house had to be elevated uh, 900 mil off the ground because of a flood inundation level, uh, sorry, overlay on the site. And the project was designed almost totally through section. So the configuration of the house was formalized as this open courtyard house, as I said earlier, and really based around the daily rituals of the client. And there was this real attempt to, to provide a visual connection uh, with the central courtyard across the site at all times. But in, importantly, I suppose as well, um, we, we created this vertical connection um, through sectional volume as well. Um, there was also an effort too to, to begin to push um, the volume out of the out of the kind of the configuration of the form um, and capture these moments of, of landscape. And these are these are treated as little private courtyard spaces that connected directly to wet areas. Um, throughout the process of construction, these sectional volumes began to emerge and reveal themselves as these strip back portal cranes, almost like constructed diagrams. And you can see here in this section, there's a sense of openness through the, throughout the um, throughout the, the project, but um, there's also a compression of ind individual spaces, um, as well as this over overall continuity. The strong sense of intimacy as well through the framing and proportion of the window at the end. We were really interested in creating these light filled moments in contrast with more controlled light um, and then these kind of intimate um, retreat path spaces. And all of which having this constant visual connection to the landscape at all times, no matter how mundane of tasks one might be doing. So in the image here, um, the two slot windows to the left, um, the, the highest one is at the height of um, the mirror in the bathroom. So whilst you're brushing your teeth, you still have this connection, this visual connection into the courtyard. And the lower one is at the height of the bath. So when you're sitting in the bath, you have this connection to the, to the courtyard. This is the library space at the southern end of the site where you can retreat into on a hot day. Um, we consciously lowered the ceiling to create intimacy. And we also used the dark form plan on the ceiling to create the subdued light to further enhance this idea of retreat. We, we, find, we find a lot using kind of black, for instance, and it kind of goes back to that black round earth too. There's this real dialing up of contrast um, and you push the views from outside really in, inside um, and the landscape begins to emerge internally through, through the green hues against the black. Um, the external cladding materials take cue from, cues from local coastal conditions and, and really attempted to create a dialogue with it. So the vertical timber cladding not only picks up the kind of colour hues of the landscape, but also the verticality of the boards begins to, to really pick up on the linear nature of the surrounding trees and the density of the surrounding trees. The red light catches uh, pick up on the on a ready sediment, um, which forms over over time on local rock formations. If anyone's ever been down to Cape Wollemi or further down the coast of Wilson's Prom, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. You get these kind of beautiful black rocks with this really rich red sediment on it. So it's really about trying to pick up on those kind of narratives. We want, really wanted this house to reside into the landscape. So we, we used landscape uh, minimally, but um, but also carefully to kind of really um, enhance this sensibility. So the idea is the house will grow off in the landscape over time and further embed itself within the site and context. This is the dining area light catcher volume in construction with the light filtering in. And the, the light filters, uh, sorry, the light catchers were inspired by um, Utzon's Honing School project from the 1970s, if you know that one, Adam. It was a, it was a, yeah, it was a beautiful kind of project. Monster. 
Yeah, and then it was I think it was turned into a house uh, more recently actually, yeah. uh, which was a, absolutely beautiful. Um, and finally, the finished kitchen and dining area where you get these kind of visual and physical connections to the landscape at varying heights. So we wanted to show this because it's a house that's currently in construction um, down on the Mornington Peninsula that we're pretty excited about. Um, it's Casa Bobinarian. Um, we started designing the house back in 2017. It's just located off a fairly popular um, surf break into Western Port Bay with Phillip Island there in the, in the distance. Um, but one of the most interesting conditions about the site was this green belt offset from the street, which leaves the frontages of, this of these houses in particular uh, quite exposed from weather and, and also really visually. In summer, it gets really busy down here, so you get lots of cars parking on the road and so forth. Um, and again, there was this really, uh, really only one spot that you can see in there, if you can see my mouse cursor there, but through the trees in through here, um, where you could get a sneak peek um, through to the ocean. So we really wanted to pick up on that. So we had this initial site idea to reside the house back into the site and create, to create privacy, and, but also create usable front space by creating this landscape kind of dune. Um, these are just some of the renders of the house uh, residing in its context from the street. The upper level operable box is placed exactly, as I said, to catch that view of the ocean between the trees and the foreshore. And the lower part of the house is also operable to open up to that semi, to create a semi-private space and a usable space between the dune and the house. Um, and, the, and also too, as a part of the client brief, um, the clients had this 1960s car that they absolutely love. Um, and so and they wanted to basically turn their garage into a showroom, um, which we're still not quite sure if we like or not. But anyway, we, 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 we I guess we, we thought about it um, in the way that we, uh, we, we wanted to create a, a hill, essentially, that they could drive the car into and, and showcase the, the car from within um, and also get away from that kind of typical kind of box garage at the front of a house. Um, our clients had this really great love for Brazilian modernism, and as do we. Um, and as such, the house takes cues from Oscar Niemeyer's house uh, that he designed for himself in 51 in Rio. Um, the rear of the site has this beautiful forest sanctuary space. So our design strategy was to really open up the house to, to it and really formulate a curve cut in, in the form to create a dialogue with this space and allow also allow natural light to, to filter into the rear areas of the house. Um, the plan is obviously then centered around this form cut to the north uh, where the landscape begins to creep into the floor plate internally. You can see in there, begins to emerge. Um, bedrooms, living and dining and kitchen zones reside into the site with direct connections to the rear yard. So this idea that you kind of sleep under the trees. Um, the study, the car, the car gallery and the jewel box, which is a space to store surfboards, are configured to the south for easy access. And again, we made these small courtyard spaces directly off the wet areas as these moments of private captured landscape. Um, and again, the, the upper level guest multi-purpose room just allows for views back towards the ocean and also to the tree canopies in the rear of the site. And then we've kind of created a, um, a small fire pit and a tower uh, along with a natural pool in the yard to further um, create, almost create these fragments to connect the house with the landscape. Uh, the final form model, an AXO uh, to the right, where we reduce the massing to the street by folding the garage and jewel box down into hills. Um, the poured roof slab on site. We've really been wanting to build a house from concrete basically since we started our practice. So it's really great to finally realize such a project. The builders have done an absolutely wonderful job of the concrete work. It's probably some of the best form concrete I've seen to date. And we're really happy in just having a having a probably a more recent um, housing project finished. That's um, beautiful. It's, it's gorgeous. Yeah, the concrete looks amazing. Yeah, the it, reveal of this concrete was one of the highlights of uh, of lockdown. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. yeah, it's the, the edges on those on, on that on that kind of curved form is just absolutely beautiful. It's just a, like a knife edge. It looks so sharp. Um, it's great. Yeah, um, and then you can see there in that image too. You can see that the relationship between that kind of upper level box and that um, cut in the trees in the foreshore. So it's placed, so you can kind of get a view through there. Um, and then this kind of um, air boy to level one, which formally turned out a really nice moment. It was one of those kind of ones that you design and then um you know it was kind of 
a grander moment in the end, which we're really pleased about. Um, an interior render of the living dining kitchen space. We get this kind of oculus that will be going over the dining table and then the kind of triangular fireplace that we fought pretty hard to keep. Um, and then that space uh, in construction, we can see light filtering in internally. And finally, um, the built footprint on site with the garage and jewel box hills ready to be dropped in. Um, so I think this is probably from about a month ago. So I think they've, uh, they're kind of almost finished those two elements now, the jewel box and the, and the garage. We're just kind of working on um, getting that to work effectively, that sliding mechanism in the, in the garage door. Um, so uh, the book. So in 2017, we published Pro Emil. It was a five-year monograph on our practice. And I guess the reason we did this, um, and we probably didn't explain this to that time when we kind of met up at the, at the bookshop, Adam, but the reason that we did this only after five years is because like most practices starting out, you do all this stuff and it's almost like you don't stop to really take stock of what it all means and, you know, where you're going. So we wanted to do that. Um, we, so we self-published the book in all aspects. So we self-funded it. We graphic designed it and arranged the book. We had Peter Clark, who we work with uh, pretty much on every project take some additional photos. We got in touch with bookshops like the Architects Bookshops and Metropolis in Melbourne. Um, the book for us was never about making money or a claim or anything like that. I think it's like most architects, um, we love architecture books. Um, so we thought, why the hell not? It's a great way to, uh, it's a great way to take stock of your work and understand what you've been doing, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. right. It was, it really, like I've got as, as the next point here, you know, the, the book really was a tool for us and, you know, something that we could kind of reflect on um, really stand back from and understand as an overall body of work um, what it was all about and really critique it and then put forward a discourse, I suppose, or a set of principles um, for the way that we approach projects moving forward. So for us, this was really an important process and it's really been quite critical into the way that we've been thinking about projects moving forward. Um, we took some time to really kind of work out how the book was to be outlined so we started off with this kind of uh, this notion of a series of shots of de detail shots, I should say, of materials, um, close-ups, which are really, you know, they're fundamental to any piece of architecture, but really quite fundamental to the way in which we work and this notion of the physicality of architecture. So then we and then next we sort of analysed our work through a series of key themes that we felt were really critical to the overall thinking of all projects. And the actual projects themselves are presented in two major slots. So the first being 11 key projects that were built up at that point, and then the second uh, being a 10 key project bracket of, of projects in progress at that time. And importantly, in between the project slots is a page called the Ideational Inventory, which is really about a series of, of ideas and conceptual references that we use within the body of work. It's the kind of, it's the, it's the dirty raw stuff that's often the most interesting stuff behind the projects. Yeah, so we wanted the book to have more of a tactile manuscript feel rather than being, um, you know, a sleek, glossy coffee table book. So um, we we kind of had this really beautiful exposed spine, which reveals the layering of ideas um, and texture, which directly we think relates directly back to to the work and, and the ideas. Um, it's yeah, it's it's been really nice. Um, we did, I mean, we did a limited run of 150 copies of the book, and I think there's only you know a few copies left. Um, and I think, you know, in a time where architecture is published like a commodity, particularly online, you know, it's up for one hour and one day and then the next thing's posted and it's like gone like yesterday's news. Books seem so e even more important that, you know, so I guess, you know, another reason that we kind of, I don't know, I, I personally would love to see other, other architects, you know, release more publications, like printed mm. publications, because I think there's, there's just so much um, richness in them. But I think um, one of the most important elements to come out of the book process was our preoccupation with, with ideas. So we, our projects are, are heavily driven by ideas. We found more often than not, you know, we find ourselves kind of referring to images such as these to describe certain ideas or narratives within projects, whether it be an overall theme or an idea for an individu individual intervention within a project. So we're really in, interested in kind of reevaluating models of history, creating these conversations with the history of art and architecture. And also really interested in exploring the possibilities of the elements of architecture. So, for instance, the ceiling, the wall, the floor. And also thinking about, I suppose, more civic elements such as the town square or the piazza or the Spanish steps or the amphitheatre. I mean, for us, there's, there's really, as I said, there's really so much richness and relevance in these types of spaces that we can kind of take from a conceptual framework and then try and reevaluate. 
So we start off the educational projects um, section of the talk with this library renovation and addition we started working on in 2012, uh, which is the year we started our practice and then completed in 2015 uh, for a school just north of Melbourne. The project uh, was completed on a really limited budget of $650,000 at the time and had a 1,400 or 1 1.4 metre vertical divide between two levels of an existing library. So we used this conceptual idea or narrative, I suppose, of the Spanish steps in Rome and took the notion of the traditional stair and turned it into this kind of um, programmatically activated series of levels to seamlessly connect the two levels of the library together. But I think um, I think the main point of note for this project was at the beginning of the project, the client was, was really adamant about throwing away the library's physical book collection and turning the whole library into a completely digital resource centre. And we really hated that idea and we, through many conversations, we convinced them to keep the books and to our delight, um, the physical book uh, borrowing in the library tripled after it opened again. And we also um, we also won our first AIA Victorian Architecture Award for this project against some seriously tough and really the best of the best at the time, which we were obviously wrapped about. But probably more importantly, it really gave us the confidence of this early time in the practice moving forward. So the next project we completed in 2015 was the Flyover Gallery at Caroline Chisholm College in, in Braybrook, Victoria. Um, it was our first project for the, for the college and we completed it for about $450,000. As I mentioned earlier, well, I haven't mentioned it earlier, but I've got a, a note here that says that. But, um, We've since, we've since completed 15 projects uh, for the college um, to, wow. uh, for, for, to date. So it's been a really great journey. That's and fantastic. So this, yeah, so this was our kind of introduction to the school. And the project was to reimagine an, an existing linkway bridge between an arts wing and a science wing within their campus. And really the only brief, the key brief point we got from the school was the kids are getting wet, so you need to fix it. So we were really interested in how not to turn this into another nondescript corridor. And at the time, I kind of just returned from this trip to Italy and began thinking about the Ponte Vecchio in Florence as this programmatically activated bridge. So our response to the project was to extend our client's brief and to activate the bridge by turning it into an art gallery. So we used the programmatic adjacency of the, as a basis for this narrative for the project, so to link art and science, but in more specific terms, um, art and geology. So in section, you have these cave-like spaces with art embedded within the walls in these kind of um, art display boxes. Um, we also used uh, the artwork of Christopher, American artist Christopher Wool um, as his point of reference in line with our, our thinking. Um, we found his more graphic works to be kind of, almost have these kind of molecular structure kind of um, diagrammatic um, uh, sort of compositions to them, I suppose. And so we translated we took a sort of an abstract of that and, and, and translated it into this perforated um, core 10 steel facade. And it was really lovely because you get these moments where the architecture starts to become art in itself, where you get the, you know, the core 10 bleeding off onto the, um, onto the paving and the shadows cast by the, the perforations. We also worked closely in conjunction with the landscape architect to redefine the existing quadrangle as this extension of the project. And this project's been a real focal point for the college within the community and, and really uh, like become a quite a kind of iconic element within the college's identity. I mean, we've seen it on billboards in Footscray and Braybrook and, and, and things like that. So it kind of, this, this one piece of, you know, this small piece of architecture is, is representing their kind of entire identity, which is wonderful. Um, but whilst working on the project, we became really obsessed with this image um, and the nature of how the structure internally was in some ways more visually interesting and rhythmic and expressive as as the finished work. So we we found so we kind of um, so this I guess this image became a foundational driver to to inform the thinking behind the next project, which is a, a multi-purpose hall. And we and again we designed this back in 2015 um, and it's just commenced construction on site. It's been a long time coming, but it's great to see it off and running. Um, it's a two basketball court multi-purpose stadium with associated change, gym, office and storage space. It's around 2,200 square metres. And essentially the school wanted a, and very much needed a place where the entire school could gather in one place. But we were really interested in investigating and really celebrating the rich history of Melbourne structuralist architecture around, you know, around the 1950s. So the likes of the, say something like the Olympic swimming pool by Kevin Ball and Peter McIntyre and um, John and Phyllis Murphy and so on. 
Um, and there's also, I guess, also too, there's, a, there's quite a rich tradition of quite good factory buildings in, in the Braybrook area and the Footscray area. So it was tapping into this somewhat contextual kind of narrative as well. The building itself is broken down into two quite distinct volumes. So a lower volume at street level and a larger stadium volume that goes into the school. Um, there's a series of kind of structural systems at play. So there's zigzag trusses to pr primary perimeter walls, um, big portal frame elements with large spanning trusses to take the sawtooth roofs. There's a large um, inverted truss system which, which carries a large spanning awning um, over some external tiered seating to the college ovals. Essentially, the building acts as a big operable tent, and so it op opens up pretty much the full perimeter using bifold, glass bifolding and counterweight fire station doors. And kind of finally, the relationship, I suppose, with the, with the large awning. Um, the underside is going to be in a kind of reflective stainless steel to kind of really kind of reflect activity from below. All right, so the next project um, is the GPFLA Learning Centre, which was built for St Francis Xavier College in Beaconsfield, southeast of Melbourne. Um, this was our largest built project to date. Um, it's uh, three, about 3,500 square metres, including uh, two levels and a forecourt, um, and it's approximately 10, built for $10 million. Uh, the brief for this project was for a series of general purpose uh, flexible learning areas, but um, specifically the school wanted 18 classrooms, uh, but with breakout provisions within the broader classroom environment. So with this in mind, we looked at uh, redefining the classroom to suit these requirements. So this involved um, us taking a typical classroom, dividing it up um, and inserting breakout spaces within that room and then pushing these um, breakout spaces outside of the original box, um, which created a new classroom model made up of a central core uh, flanked by these smaller breakout areas. And then we looked at how this diagram could be transformed into, transformed into a, um, a type of cell that could be uh, replicated across the site and really um, help create the form, drive the program and inform the landscape and forecourt. So essentially the main driver for the whole project. Um, and here in the aerial image, you get that overall sense of the repetitious nature of the interlocking cells um, embodied in the final built form. And then moving further into the building uh, at a human and, and a macro scale, this, this language of, of form is, is still really evident and present. Um, another key aspect of the brief for this project was the requirement for the forecourt to link directly to the first floor. So we looked at this as an opportunity to do something more than just a traditional external stair. Um, we took inspiration from the Giants Causeway in Northern Ireland and along with the landscape architect, um, we rationalised this idea into a sprawling external terrace of sorts um, that not only provided access directly to level one, but also acts as a meeting space and external seating and informal study area, um, as well as social spaces for students and staff. Across all levels of the building, um, it embodies the outcomes of this uh, stacking and interlocking of the classroom cells. So this imparts a, a formal rhythm throughout the building and connects all the spaces. And then the connection of levels is, is then further enhanced through a series of first floor voids, uh, which allow the penetration of, of northern light into the volumes um, and provide a visual connection between the internal spaces. There was also a requirement of the brief for a variety of flexible common and learning areas. Uh, so one of our strategies uh, to address this was the design of, of this study forest, as we called it, um, in the main central space. So this provides areas for informal individual study and also class groups. Um, and these joinery trees thread into sleeves embed into the ground slab and therefore they can be easily removed to open this whole space up um, and arranged in um, different configurations. Uh, externally fixed metal screens um, are perforated again with an abstract of that classroom cell graphic um, and used along the entire north facade. The screens cloak the building um, and define the form externally, while internally filter and control the sunlight, casting dappled light and shadow across the interior spaces. The causeway itself is punctuated with veins of natural um, soft planting which add to that sense of organically wandering through a landscape uh, as you ascend to the first floor. And then here in the overall, you get a sense of, uh, a strong sense of this organic sprawl of the terrace out of the building and then spilling into the forecourt below. From the aerial perspective, again, the, 
the um, the natural, almost whimsical kind of nature of uh, of how you can traverse this landscape is exposed. Um, walking, jumping over, uh, jumping over plants, and and walking diagonally, and it, it allows a, a, a real possibility to traverse, but also um, stop and um, and sit with a friend or have lunch under one of the jacaranda trees. Uh, so it is a, quite a social space for students as well. And the final image uh, of this project just shows the building in its wider context. Um, so it's uh, it's quite it, it's quite um, heavily massed along along the south of the of the school boundary, uh, and then opens to this northern courtyard and the forecourt forecourt spilling out with the uh, with the terrace to the north. Beautiful and crisp. Yeah, it's, a, it's building. Um, I think we're we're really for the for the size of the building we're really happy with the you know the uh, I guess embodiment of the concept in the overall built form. Mm -hmm. um, this one uh, definitely presented some about some challenges for us, but we're we're really happy with how, how it ended up. <laughs> I'm sure the roofer was excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. I mean, I think the the uh, the nice the, the really nice thing is that the built form is is kind of reflecting the internal arrangement of the uh, education spaces, which in classrooms is super hard to achieve. So nice work. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> so the next project, the Arts Epicenter, essentially ran in conjunction with the previous project. Um, so we designed it back in 2014 and again completed it late last year. Um, geez, we completed a lot of work last year. Uh, we built the project for $5 million and it's 1,800 square metres over two levels, which we built for about $2,800 a square metre. So the brief from the college was to amalgamate um, campus art programs and essentially ask for a fairly standardised arts building. So we really saw it as a great opportunity and, and rationalised the project from, from day one as this kind of garage performing arts centre. and really took more of a kind of civic or public type of approach to the project from, from the very start. Um, I took this photo at the late Peter Corrigan's VCA Drama School in Melbourne whilst attending a performance one night. I had this amazing experience which really stayed, you know, through, with us throughout the, the design of this building. Essentially, Peter had designed the practice spaces directly connected to the main foyer. So when we entered... Um, we, we were greeted by these series of ballerinas and they were all dressed in white and their faces were covered in mud, dancing around on this marine blue floor. If they were, you know, they looked like they were dancing on water. It was amazing. And, and it wasn't set up. It was just simply students um, practising for another performance elsewhere in the building. And as I said, you know, this reference played a key role in the way we really thought about, thought our building. And, and not in the sense of the way that it kind of this this particular project looks, but it, the way that it functions. So it's it's idea, this idea that that circulation could be kind of theatre. So the site for this building was formerly an existing convent, which essentially was dilapidated and had to be demolished. But it had some really great endearing features um, and spatial conditions, which we wanted to celebrate in our new building. Um, the site backed onto this existing courtyard, which we loved and really wanted to use as an extension of, of our, our floor plate for, on an our building. So we had this primary site idea for the courtyard to become an indoor outdoor theater space. And so you can see here in the finished building, um, which opens up to a re-landscaped courtyard uh, by a 13 by three meter high airport door, which opens with a turn of one key. The form of the building was derived by a series of site-related moves, but the primary one being this kind of large subtraction um, forming the primary internal external performance space. The ground floor is programmed primarily for dance and drama, while le level one is programmed for art and music. So this performance space has this series of light catches which hang down from the space to create this sense of drama. It's also a really highly flexible space. It can be closed down using black stage curtains and you can basically close the whole thing off uh, and the backdrop off. And the floor area can expand, obviously, out into the courtyard, but also across as well by that movable furniture you can see there in the bottom. And there was this really conscious decision um, to configure the practice spaces around the periphery of the main performance space so that they could be borrowed during performances as essentially sort of orchestra pits, for example, um, where a band could play, you know, backing music to a performance. And similarly, there's this continuity of space right through the building. There's this little cut in the back of the smaller cut in the back back of the southern side of the building, which allows the primary school students who share the college ovals um, next door to be able to look in and see what the big kids are doing. So there's this real conscious effort with this building to, to make a building that is more community inclusive and more civically minded. Um, the material palette throughout is quite purposely subdued. 
So this is really to allow users and the building building's occupation to become the primary focus. Um, this is, again, this is kind of dialing up of contrast to celebrate occupation and landscape. We use the stainless steel mesh as this device to create a visual curtain, um, but also allow a sense of transparency to allow everyday users to become part of the, the overall performance of the space, just going about their day. Um, so here you have the, the main performance space. Um, there's another black steel stair which doubles as a stage platform to be used during performances. And again, attempting to solidify this narrative of user becoming a part of the overall performance of the space. The light catches over the main performance space were derived from an existing motif uh, on the facade of the former con convent building. They had this great um, structural umbrella-like uh, formal condition, which we wanted to elaborate on. So this is our physical model testing of form and light. And then, um, the steel frames, which were clad in plywood and so on site, and then craned up into place. And then some photographs, or photograph of the finished light catches in the ceiling. And I guess, um, again, like, you know, this building takes a lot of cues from some of the res residential projects we've undertaken to date, where we've kind of experimented with this notion of the contrast between light-filled open space and more intimate and residual reflection space. Um, I just wanted to show this slide because we recently won a Dulux Colour Award for this project and I thought we'd better actually show that we did use colour for the project. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think the jury's comments were the most powerful project by the use of restraint, which we, <laughs> which we really love actually, particularly in the context of educational architecture where you see a lot of people, you know, using colour really, really badly, um, unless, pretty much unless you're, you know, MCR who, who know exactly how colour is done. It's gorgeous. Um, it's gorgeous. I, I agree with you. Too many people in schools use colour badly. MCR do it fantastically. Fantastically yeah. done. Yeah, we're big fans. Um, so this is a little project we were asked to do um, after another architect had just finished uh, building their campus. Uh, it's at Sacred Heart Primary School in St Albans in Melbourne. And essentially this was the situation that we were, we were left to deal with. So this is the entry, the, the primary entry to the primary school. Um, and that window that you can see through those signs is actually the main office reception. So we were asked to create a form of entry through a covered canopy and some landscaping, but also, most importantly, to give the school some form of identity within the community. So this, our response was this. So basically some dignified signage, um, a gate which the college was pretty adamant about given the nature of the local context. There's some pretty seriously dodgy stuff that happens in the area um, and a really quite a big concern for the principal. Um, so we conceptualised um, the gate and the fence as this kind of stage curtain revealing the, the, the school to the community. Um, there's some landscape elements which we created for parents to wait whilst picking up kids and also a primary canopy structure to create this sense of formal entry. Um, so this was an early Burley Marx inspired drawing we did which really looked at kind of formalising areas and breaking up the paving into these fragments of spaces and just giving this sense of journey through graphic means like Early Marks was brilliant at. Um, this is the final plan with landscape, um, some perimeter seating, the floor finishes and, and the canopy over. Um, so formally the canopy curves to really capture um, specific moments um, around trees and to capture areas within this, the overall space. This is just a model um, where we really had to make sure and prove to the client that the receptionist could see the front gate to open it when visitors arrived during the day. Um, the canopy itself, we told, we, we basically told ourselves we weren't allowed to use columns and beams. So the, the entire canopy is made from steel plate with matching um, steel webs only. Um, and the canopy is also supported by a single form black uh, concrete wall, curved concrete wall, which we rationalise as kind of chapel or reflective space. And we use logs to create this rough fluted um, texture in the concrete. We created apertures in the in the canopy as well to allow light to permeate and play along the concrete. So these are just some um, finished but unfinished shots we took of the construction process. I think the um, the reveal of this concrete was probably one of our, another one of the highlights of um, of this job, similar to the uh, the house we were talking about earlier. So you get that veil of the of the of the fence. We haven't actually had it professionally photographed yet, but we will be soon. Um, and I just wanted to kind of follow into the next project. We've got two projects, ads. Are we running okay on for time? Oh, go for it. Why not? Yeah, great. <laughs> um, 
Um, yeah, so we, we felt that this was kind of a nice um, kind of going into the next project, which is the um, Piazza dell'Ufficio, which simply translates to Office Plaza. Uh, it's a project from 2017 and we completed it in 2018. Um, it won the best uh, small workplace and the best interior project of the year in last year's Global Design Awards in London. So from an awards perspective for us, it's been a real highlight. Um, it was a fit-out project and a reimagining of Caroline Chisholm Catholic College's um, student welfare services and primary senior administration. So the context of the project, Caroline Chisholm is pretty, it's a fairly con conservative school when it comes to um, teachers and their offices. The teachers love their own offices. But we had a really uh, fairly open brief um, to create more kind of collaborative and flexible spaces. But really, I suppose the, the, the school really just wanted a space that they could be proud of, given it was also the, the sort of primary administration area. So this is the existing condition. Um, it's really, it was horrible, this horrible rabbit warren of kind of awful office spaces. And it really offered no humanist form of interaction for staff and students using the space. That, um, if you can see that image has come up there. So that jail-like metal door is actually the main entrance to the space off the school corridor for the students. And this is a space where students with problems at home or maybe they have a mental health issue are coming to meet with a teacher or a school counsellor for the first time. So our key pedagogical strategy was to create a space that reduced barriers and encouraged engagement between um, staff and students, particularly in the context of student welfare services. And so we used the key idea uh, of the public piazza to solve this problem, and particularly in the area of student welfare, so which requires an initial kind of informal chat between a, a staff member and a student, and then often leads to kind of uh, more of a private meeting setting where they go off and you know, to, um, talk about the, the problem in, in more detail. And we really like the way that this coincided with the notion of meeting a friend, you know, at the at a piazza, um, you know, and then going off and and going off to a destination, so a coffee shop or something, and having lunch uh, for a more in depth chat. We re so we really began to analyse the piazza and all of its elements, um, and we also looked very closely at the architectural elements of some of these places that we were interested in. And I think probably the most important one was this kind of creating these. Um, spaces of, of event um, that something takes place here and also th the subdued light that's cast underneath the porticos within piazza spaces. And I guess finally too, the, the architectural language embedded within these, some of these piazza spaces, so the colonnade and the notion of repetition. So we use the, hard, the humble cardboard tube as a primary material for the project. Um, cardboard tubes were explored because they really offered a, a rich textual warmth and primarily really because they were economically, they were, you could make um, curves really easily with them. Also too, cardboard tubes were $2.50 each and this really allowed us um, with a kind of limited budget, I suppose, to, um, to kind of build the project for about $2,300 a square metre. So this is the image of the main clock tower where you go, where a student will go to meet a, a staff member and then go off um, from here to one of the sort of peripheral offices. Um, to the left and right. We kind of put some seating to the peripheral areas of the piazza in the same way that cafe seats look out into a piazza. Some of the beautiful ceiling details, we kind of get the cardboard tubes coming in with the ceiling and some of the profiles with the ceiling. Uh, a kind of typical meeting room, uh, a stair leading up through into the space. This is kind of a vent. Um, some stair details that we were quite, we were quite particular on. I think probably one of the most interesting points of note for this project uh, was after completing the project, we had some serious backlash from some of the staff working in there. And I think this is mainly because we hadn't given them the kind of traditional four plasterboard wall office that they'd always known. But it was great because after about three months, um, we told that we'd been told that there'd kind of been a complete 180 turnaround and they absolutely loved the space. They even commented on how much it had improved their way of working and collaborating with others. And I guess we've, We've thought about this a lot since, and in many ways, we feel like in some ways this is a better result to measure the success of a project rather than the staff loving it from day one. So I feel like we, you know, we pushed them for the better and it really paid off. Existing conditions plan where we basically reconfigured into the space and designs connected by the central piazza. And then we drew this kind of sketch plan over the top, which is really about creating a kind of spatial continuity um, through formal line and curve. So like basically adding a softness to the rigidity of the program. 
And in here is the final plan so and, and the section. So you can see the central piazza space with the, with the central clock tower where the students go to meet a teacher for a quick chat and then go off to one of the meeting rooms. Um, the clock tower is graphically linked to three lines on the floor um, to a public forum space where the principal can, can, can use to um, address groups of staff and the like. And you can see that those spaces in section um, are purposely lowered to create these moments of event. Just an exploded isometric where you get the components of the project. Um, the rigorous detailing of the, of the cardboard tubes allows the tubes to be easily removed or replaced if necessary. So there's a notch in the top and the bottom of each tube, and then they, sleeve on, they basically sleeve onto a pre-curved angle. These are then pushed up tight um, with the last tube in line being screw fixed and locked into place. So the tubes themselves are five mil thick, and they're quite strong and rigid, not like a kind of Christmas wrapping paper tubes. Um, and the tubes are untreated, they're recycled and recyclable. Um, they're fully biodegradable and obviously making it a hugely sustainable material. And I just wanted to finish this project. There's one project to go, um, and this is the much more kind of approachable student entry from the school corridor rather than that kind of um, jail-like door that we saw earlier. So final project of the night. Um, this is a project that we we're currently working on and be commencing construction hopefully next year. It's a new centre for arts and technology. It's around 3,000 square metres. Um, it's got a budget of about $25 million. So it's going to be the largest uh, budget project in the history of the Diocese of Sale for education. So we're really excited about that. Um, and the project incorporates machinery workshops through to art media studios, um, some gallery space and flexible learning spaces on three levels. The primary narrative uh, for the project came from a master plan we did for the college. And in some ways, again, it's this follow on from the last project I showed you, whereby we use the piazza as this central reference and the central idea. In this case, we were more specific in piazza and we used the Piazza del Campo and Siena to first kind of formulate um, the configuration of the building on site. Um, an early sectional sketch allowed us to start thinking about some key programmatic ideas about connections and a kind of process methodology to the building. Um, and here, kind of in the more finished section, you see some of these ideas from the sketch coming to life. So the ground floor is arranged with storerooms to the west, um, then workshop space is more centralised. Then there are what we call the pod towers, which run all the way up through the buildings, which are kind of small, intimate and bookable studio spaces. Um, they're linked to, a, visually connected to, a, to foyers on all levels. And then finally, the colonnade space onto the piazza. And then the upper level studio spaces go from kind of more conventional group studios uh, to the west through to uh, more formal, uh, sorry, less formal, I should say, breakout spaces to the east. So at the end of 2019, we had a scheme for the exterior of the building, which we really weren't convinced with. Firstly, there was no sense of economy to the facade. Every archway was different. And secondly, we just kept seeing an oversaturation of people using arches in a pretty arbitrary way. So we kind of asked ourselves, is there a way that we can think about this a little bit differently? And kind of in a sense, we decided to go with a complete formal opposite of the arch and think about the possibilities of, of inverting its form. We then became really interested in the possibilities of using this as a compositional element in terms of the notion of repetition, and then as a result became really excited about the spaces in between. And because the building houses art, um, we really wanted to kind of look at a way in which that we could represent this meaningfully in the facade. So we began to look at um, the, the work of Ab American artist Ab Ellsworth Kelly and his geometric sort of abstract work, and this really opened up a lot of possibilities for us in the way that we were thinking. So in turn, we came up with this um, abstraction of our original archway as this kind of two-dimensional um, drawing. But we, we weren't happy with that, and we kind of really wanted to elaborate on this and, and probably develop it into something a little bit more three-dimensional. So we re re revisited our original Piazza reference, which had this really great architectonic kind of um, certain formal cupping to the, to the Piazza. So we made some models, and then this kind of began to give us cues to, the, uh, to, to this idea and how we might approach it at, at varying scales. And we also, again, revisited Ellsworth Kelly's later works, particularly sculpture works, which had this certain architectonic and compositional quality that kind of were in line with what we were thinking. So we developed this panel, panel system, which could be scaled up and down to create two different types, so one large podium panel and a second smaller sunscreen device. So the large, panel, the large podium panels will be made from a formed concrete in two parts so they can fit on the back of a truck and the second smaller sunscreens uh, on the upper levels um, 
other scale to get maximum efficiency um, and least waste from a single standard sheet of compressed cement. And the, both, both obviously, pretty much the, the entire ex external facade is going to be in a textural red sienna colour. It's this kind of way of, of, um, of, of formulating kind of an overall composition. We're really interested in the, the, the composition of these panels and elevation, which have this really, we were inspired by these kind of neoclassical buildings um, around piazzas. And in terms of the, kind of the notions of kind of rhythm and hierarchy, which we think we, we still think are really important values. So I'm just going to finish now by kind of taking you through a few renders of the project to date. Um, so this is the entry colonnade. We were really adamant about not creating a real sense of formal entry. We, we love the way that you kind of walk through some of those neoclassical buildings from piazzas and there's no real sense of entry. You can enter anywhere. Um, the overall building within its context. Um, the primary foyer and main stair with the pod towers to the right there. Uh, the view from the piazza. We're currently working with a landscape architect in developing um, in the piazza into something probably a little bit more activated. Uh, these are the pod towers at level one, which then have this kind of they, – they, they're nice because they have this sense of intimacy and kind of distinction from some of the more open spaces in the public spaces in the building like something like this, where you get these spaces colliding. Um, and there's this great notion that we really want to play with the idea of making versus, you know, unfinished and finished, I guess. So these um, views down into the workshops at level one and then these kind of gallery spaces, so they're visually linked. So there's this notion of, of, of making and, and finished art and then kind of this connection of kind of learning spaces and um, on, each, on all levels. And um, finally, the last slide, and and there. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. That's awesome, guys. Thanks so much. It's really so nice to see the work and see, you know, the transition from was it um, uh, Nick your family's orchard that the first project was in? Is that right? Correct. Yeah, that's where we we started off. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I love it. I love it. I love that idea. You you two could um, unshare your screen now, and I'll just bring you back on. Um, yeah, I love that seeing the transition from this idea of um, you know building in the backyard, <laughs> which is quite nice, to then building these kind of contemporary piazzas that uh, you're talking about, which is really great as an as a kind of idea to think about. Um, yeah. I want to know though, Nick. Are you, do you actually your brother is your brother a landscape architect? Did you say that at the start? Yeah. Um, yes, Brad. Yeah, Brad did. So we did share the original office with my brother, and um, yeah, he's a landscape architect, and um, we have collaborated. Um, I guess our projects do tend to have a pretty close kind of um, blur between landscape and and buildings, and, and I think that's aided by some close collaboration with um, with Carl. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, if you were him, though, you'd be like, I want every la of your landscape projects. <laughs> uh, just the one thing that kind of comes to mind when I'm looking at your work is there's obviously quite a deal of trust between your clients, particularly your education clients, because it's quite hard to get schools to, uh, or, you know, departments of education or schools or the um, Catholic schools to agree to some of the things you're talking about, especially in terms of the changing the pedagogy and kind of thinking about different ways of teaching and different ways of engaging with the community. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how you get them on board? I know you said, Brad, there was kind of a point when the tech, you know, the first one, was the, the um, cardboard tubes, they hated it to begin with and they got there. Yeah. I think, um, so we have one particular client, so Caroline Chisholm, um, who we've done, you know, over 15 projects for, the principal, uh, Marco de Cesare, is the client that, you know, you dream of. Um, he really is uh, one of those guys who really, he cares more about the students than himself in a lot of ways. He's kind of, you know, a lot of, you see it, you see it around, like a lot of principals have got these big offices and things. He's very modest, um, you know, spend all the money on the kids. Um, so he's he's kind of, you know, in a lot of ways, we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we've achieved without, you know, his kind of support. Um, you know, he's, he's funny sometimes. He kind of comes to us and says, you know, is this is this going to work? And we basically have to just reassure, reassure him and say, you know. Yes, 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 trust us, trust us. It'll work, it'll work. That's <laughs> always kind of a little bit of a stress, but yeah. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> yeah I, I think in, the, in that way we've, we've, we've been really lucky. But, I mean, there's been some other clients too that we've, it's been uh, a hard kind of grain to, to push against, and mm. and uh, and and really kind of, you know, at times it's it's really hard work. Um, 
Absolutely. I think we're kind of we're kind of in that still in that kind of niche as well where we we do attract like clients with with forward thinking kind of attitudes towards pedagogy and things like that. Um, and and a lot of that that kind of thinking is also driven by the way that they want to, to take their their teaching methods, um, which has been helpful. Um, but yeah, really a lot of trust is um, is crucial. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Again, the cleaners have just arrived in my office, so the vacuum cleaner is starting. So that's my that's my um, my sign to kind of sign off. Uh, to everyone else, watch there. Grab the copy of this book, uh, 22 Decades of Architecture in Australia by Cameron Brune, uh, published by Thames and Hudson. Fantastic um, publication. Uh, again, to the guys at uh, Branch G Architects, thanks so much for tonight. We really appreciate the work. Thanks, uh, and uh, we'll be in touch with the next... Uh, we've got the, I think we're going to do one more Architects uh, Isolation talk, so I'll let you know what that is about. Uh, so we'll see you soon.